Thank you. We turn now to our next item of business, which is topical questions. And we have one question today. It's from Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the ruling by the European Court of Justice that the UK can unilaterally revoke Article 50. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Court's ruling is a hugely important decision that provides clarity at an essential <laughs> moment. People in Scotland overwhelmingly voted to remain in the EU. That continues to be the best option for Scotland and indeed for the UK as a whole. Thanks to the efforts of Scotland's parliamentarians, and let me name check them, uh, Andy Whiteman, uh, uh, Ross Greer, Joanna Cherry, uh, Alan Smith, uh, Catherine Styler, and David Martin, and also to name check Jolyon Mon and the legal team, we now know beyond doubt that remaining in the EU is not only the best option, but one that can clearly be achieved, and the Scottish Government believes it should be. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. It's a very important ruling by the ECG. Will he join with me in congratulating the Scottish politicians involving securing clarity, at least on one aspect, as far as Brexit is concerned? Does he agree with me in the light of the ECG ruling? And given the total chaos that exists at Westminster, that it's time for politicians to use this ECG ruling to find a way to end this Brexit madness and the potential of a no-deal scenario. Cabinet Secretary. I, I do agree. I, I think it is very difficult to find words that adequately express the sense of chaos and, and, and dismay uh, at Westminster and the real sense of dismay within the country at large. I've just been meeting uh, with some stakeholders who uh, were confirming with me that uh, investment by them and by others will simply not take place uh, because there is just no idea of what is going to happen next. Now, this ruling makes clear there is a route to revocation of the Article 50 notification. It must be unequivocal and unconditional. A second EU referendum, including the option to remain in the EU, would provide such a way forward. We've always said that remaining in the EU would be the best outcome. Now, of course, we've offered compromise after compromise, particularly in the form of the membership of the Single Market and Customs Union, and those continues to be options that would minimise the damage of Brexit to Scotland. But we need to decide how to move forward, we need to be clear how to move forward, and this does provide uh, much needed clarity. And I do, I've name-checked those involved. I, I do pay tribute to them. Uh, uh, quite clearly, it was not an easy decision for many of them to be involved in, and indeed many of us wondered what the outcome would be. Now we know we should use it. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary again. Given the chronic leadership vacuum that exists at Westminster over Brexit and the serious damage being forced on our country, what's the Scottish Government's view on whether a way forward can be found that can command a majority in the House of Commons? And does he believe that the time has come to put the people in charge and let them democratically decide their own future through a people's vote? Cabinet Secretary. One of the most extraordinary things in, in this process has been the sight of the Prime Minister uh, rampaging up and down the country, well, in Scotland, uh, uh, within half an hour's travel of Glasgow Airport, which for her accounts was rampaging up and down the country, and now going off to... Uh, uh, to, to the continent uh, to talk to people, but never actually saying that the people who count are the voters themselves. And that is what now needs to happen. The people of Scotland have already been clear. They voted overwhelmingly in 2016 to remain in the EU. That remains the best option. And, and I have to say, at this particular juncture, where we are with the chaos that we've seen, and, and as a member said, the leadership vacuum, then quite clearly a second referendum would offer the opportunity for Scotland's views to be respected rather than be ignored, as they have been throughout this disastrous process. Now, for that to happen, it would seem clear that the current Prime Minister needs to get out of the way. She's insisting on pursuing her deal, even though it makes Scotland and the UK poorer, and indeed in circumstances where there is no deal. Uh, the, the deal has been rejected by this Parliament by, and the Welsh Assembly. It would have been rejected by the House of Commons had it been given a, a chance to vote on it, and even the House of Lords had to suspend its debate. So I think it's absolutely clear that the Prime Minister is not going to lead anywhere, anybody anywhere. What we need is an expression of popular will, and I think that can come about now uh, by uh, the so-called people's vote. We've got uh, three supplementaries this afternoon. The first from Andy Whiteman to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I would like also to thank my fellow petitioners, Joanna Cherry, Ross Greer, David Martin, Joe Mom, Alan Smith and Catherine Styler. I'd also like to thank our legal team, Aidan O'Neill QC, David Welsh QC, Maya Lester QC and Elaine Motion, Chair of Balfour Manson. And finally, but not least, to thank those many members of the public who've contributed to 
our crowdfunder. The Court of Justice says that the UK can revoke the Article 50 notification unilaterally and that the purpose of that revocation is to confirm the EU membership of the member state concerned under terms that are un changed. Given that the Advocate General for Scotland on behalf of the UK Government has consistently opposed this action for a year, can the Cabinet Secretary recall a government in the past that has gone to such length and such expense to oppose the right of the people to find out their legal rights? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, it is difficult to find a parallel, but then it's difficult to find a parallel for this entire UK Tory government, which is uh, uh, completely, uh, um, uh, absolutely unique in how it is operated, and particularly uniquely anti-democratic. Let me repeat my tribute to those who took part in the case, to Andy Whitenham and to his colleagues. They have done a, uh, an important task. Uh, they've done a task which at the beginning didn't seem to be possible, but has now proved to be possible, and they've contributed enormously to this process, all of them, and I pay tribute to them. But the important thing now is to look forward from this. There is a, a route open. The route has been opened up. And as the Andy Whiteman has said, presiding officer, it is also uh, withdrawing the notification and remaining on the same terms, which is extremely important. So in those circumstances, I again urge the UK government to take that very clear step. Adam Tompkins to be followed by Polly McNeill. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Three things struck me about this curious uh, judgment. First, it's very much rooted in state sovereignty, and that is to say in the sovereignty of the United Kingdom state. Second, um, the court says, it's paragraph 66 of its judgment, um, that a member state could revoke notification given under Article 50 to leave the European Union, Union if expressed through its democratic process. Does the minister accept that there has been no democratic expression in the United Kingdom that Article 50 should be revoked. And the third thing that struck me when I read this judgment is that the um, uh, notice to revoke must be given in accordance with the member state's constitutional requirements. That's a phrase that the court uses several times in its judgment, notably at paragraph 73. So I wonder what, if the minister has taken advice. He says that this judgment adds clarity. It seems to me that it does the very opposite. I wonder if the minister has taken advice on what the UK's constitutional requirements would be um, to uh, revoke uh, notice given under Article 50. Are we talking about a ministerial power to be exercised under the prerogative? Are we talking about the requirement of an act of the United Kingdom Parliament? Or does the minister consider that we would need a fresh referendum for this uh, matter to be complied with? Cabinet Secretary. It is extraordinary, presiding officer, that the, the member, who I, I acknowledge is a very clever man, uh, requires to question the basics of democracy every time he gets up to speak in this chamber. Uh, and really, what we've just heard, presiding officer, is sophistry. Uh, that is all it is. The reality is that there is a way out of this enormous mess. It is a way that uh, uh, the member might have welcomed, because he, he has claimed, and I don't doubt his claim, that he voted to remain. It uh, clears up the mess that his party has made at Westminster. So I think it's entirely clear. I don't regard this judgment as curious. I regard this judgment as telling us something which we actually probably already knew, but it's useful to have confirmed. <laughs> but it took an awful, as Mr. Whiteman said, an awful long time uh, because of the actions of the UK government. It's absolutely clear there should be a democratic expression of will. And it's absolutely clear that the constitutional requirements are met. That's not a surprise. The democratic expression of will I, could be a resolution of the parliament, of course. It might be an encouragement for a people's vote, of course. And yeah. if the member's encouraging that, I'm glad to hear it. But the second one is, if the UK parliament, if the people of these islands, if the people of these four countries say that they don't want to leave the EU, that's enough for me. I think they should be allowed to say that. Polly McNeill. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the ECG decision simply means that the UK Parliament is sovereign over the question of Brexit? Um, I realise there isn't much time left uh, before the Christmas holiday period, but can the Cabinet Secretary outline if there are any meetings scheduled with the UK Government? And finally, does the Cabinet Secretary think that the arrangements set out in Scotland's place in Europe 2016 in the light of various events that have happened in the last few months require some revision? 
Uh, but on the final point, I mean, we've, we've constantly developed and, and revised and built our arguments, and that's the right thing to do. But the basic thesis, I think, is correct. If the UK government was to accept a compromise, the compromise we proposed was we believe the best alternative to actually leaving. And that remains the case. Uh, but I think, but, you know, given the mess that is now existing at Westminster and the way in which the Prime Minister and the Tory party have led it, that the point I'm making now is I suspect that a people's vote is the clearest and best way to move forward. But, uh, you know, Scotland's place in Europe argues a strong case, and that case still uh, stands. In terms of meetings of the Joint Ministerial Committee, discussions are taking place about one uh, to be held before Christmas, but there is no confirmation of that at the present moment. I'm not entirely sure what it would discuss, because I'm not entirely sure what the Prime Minister is resolving by uh, going and, and, and talking to people who have already said there will be no renegotiation. Uh, but, of course, we're always willing to have a conversation. Uh, in terms of the sovereignty of the UK Parliament, I mean, this, of course, is something which... Um, I can't say I'm fond of. Uh, devolution is a, a sort of careful balancing act in which the devolved parliaments of, of these islands dance around the concept of the sovereignty of the UK Parliament. It was interesting to see yesterday that Liam Fox is apparently now denying the sovereignty of the UK Parliament because apparently only the government matters. And in those circumstances, I think you have to say it is the Tories' understanding of democracy that's at fault here, something demonstrated uh, beyond any doubt by the question we had from... Professor Tompkins. Thank you very much, and that concludes topical questions today. We'll move on to our next item of business, which is a debate on motion 15096 in the name of Fergus Ewing on sea fisheries and end of year negotiations. And I would ask members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. <laughs> 